The Forever Winter devs have once again released a set of Q&A responses from questions they received on their Discord server. A reminder, this week Miles is actually gone. He's apparently away wheeling and dealing to see if we can get some figurines into our grubby little hands soon. So here's hoping good things come about that. In Miles' place this week is Jason. I believe he's the composer and sound designer. He has a lot of interesting stuff to say about that kind of stuff. Anyway, you know the deal. I'm Johnny Lockjaw, and let's talk about it. First, as always, let's go over some gameplay stuff. There's a question on whether the different factions will have separate and different sounding voices, accents, and different voice lines that they speak. Jason does say that this is a part of the overall sound design moving forward. He also mentions that there's a new round of voiceover stuff that they're doing, so that sounds super interesting. He did also mention that this kind of stuff takes a lot of work, either with writing and then getting the different talent necessary that they actually want that meets their quality standards. So don't be surprised if this takes a little bit of time, but it does sound like something they do want to implement. Jeff also mentions that there's some stuff going on behind the scenes with the different factions that he can't really get into in great detail, but that might require a little bit of coding. The example that was provided is that how some Spec Ops units will basically give you no information and they'll be quick and concise over radio chatter. And obviously, if you have a bunch of conscripts, they're going to be screaming all kinds of information at you. So it'll be super interesting to see where that goes and what comes of all of that. But for now, there's no real timetable that was given. It is super cool to see, though, that that is something that we're going to get. Obviously, hopefully it'll be good but I'm sure with the level of quality that they have, it will be. After that, somebody asked what the plans were to keep the game unpredictable and deadly. Actually, something upcoming on the new patch that we're looking forward to right now. Hopefully, this new retooling will allow different enemies like grabbers and other things that are super dangerous and actually really difficult to deal with on all the different maps and not just the few where the grabbers exist right now. They didn't mention which specific maps were getting updated or if all of them were, so, you know, keep up with that. The new patch is supposed to be here by the end of October, and right now it's the 25th as of recording, so so, you know, who knows when that'll actually drop. He did also mention something that they've kind of talked about and alluded to already, which is a system that kind of has framework already that they want to try to implement, where, where the game responds to what's happening within the war and reacts accordingly. There's a bunch of different ways that that can be implemented, and there's a bunch of different things that they can do to sort of make it relevant and also unique to what it is that's happening. Obviously, in games before, they've had systems like that. So, you know, hopefully this is super interesting. Jeff does mention that he doesn't want to rely super heavily on player interaction for the system. Obviously, players are smart, and if they tie the system to player-specific actions, then the players will eventually figure out what actions trigger what events. And, obviously, because the Forever Winner exists in spite of you, not because of you, he doesn't want to do that, so... Give him some time. Moving on, somebody asked if later iterations of the player progression system, or skill tree basically, will wipe progress once implemented. This is something that's been asked before, but there's a little more detail that goes into it. Jeff mentions that obviously they want to try to avoid wiping player progression where possible. Obviously, it's an early access game, so if they change the system so significantly that what it is that they do can't really be correlated into actual progression overlap, then, you know, they kind of have to wipe the system. If that happens, they will make sure that it's communicated and it won't just happen and then people will, you know, be mad that all of their progress is wiped and they didn't have any way of knowing. They are going to try to avoid it and there's a bunch of different ways to get around that. He does mention specifically that realistically, if they can avoid it, they will try to make it where even if, say, they have to retool the progression system as it is now, they will try to make sure that even if it resets the character specific tree, that you will be refunded at least or keep the experience that you've gained so that you can basically just re-level the character. I think that's probably probably the best way of doing that. Games like Dark Tide have this problem sometimes where they retool the character progression tree, but basically they don't wipe the character levels. So you keep all the XP and all the different stuff that you have. So once the update occurs, basically, you can just re-put the skill points back into the skill tree in the different way that you can and want. So, you know, this is a good way of doing it, to be honest. It's really not that bad. Obviously, again, if they can't avoid this problem, then they will communicate it. So again, hopefully it doesn't happen, but again, early access, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We've been over this kind of stuff before. Really Realistically, they're doing all they can to make it more user-friendly. I trust them at this point to do that. They are changing the water system over this sort of issue. So here we are. I do want to mention and point out actually too, speaking of water system, Jeff does mention specifically that he doesn't like character progression being wiped entirely. Although Jeff mentioned specifically that he doesn't like character wipe unless you know the details going into it that actually causes it. So it's a cheeky little way of him defending the water system or at least water deaths when it was implemented. But you know, they're changing that. So, 
Yeah, here we are. Moving on because of the personnel shift. I didn't actually identify any lore or technical questions going into this, so we're going to move into some planned content now. So this is obviously a new thing. Obviously, let me know if I misidentified these, and I will try to keep track of it in the future going forward. But honestly, I don't think that there are any of those specific types of questions. Anyway, the first of the planned content questions is whether or not we'll be given access to a fully modular rig. Right now, we have a basic rig system that's super dev friendly, where we basically get all of the preset loadouts that we can have that actually attach to specific parts, essentially. And then with those different presets that we have, we can mix and match the different components and stuff that we actually put into the rig specifically. So long story short, yes, at some point they're hoping to have a player facing customization for the rigs. What it is that that'll entail is sort of up in the air. There really isn't any game plan for it at this moment. Obviously right now with the system that they have at play, they don't have to really worry about players creating an OP rig effect effectively, and they don't have to balance any of that issues. A fun little thing to mention, though, at the back end of this, there is apparently some new rig equipment to be seen soon. There wasn't any detail on that, so hopefully that's cool. I do like the increased customization and loadout types. I'm curious to know whether or not that specific thing will be lost if you die, basically. Right now, if you've played the game, if you die, you lose basically everything except for the rig that you bring in. So, for example, you keep the rig that you have, but any rig of upgrades that you put onto it, you lose. On top of that, you also lose your guns and your equipment and all that kind of stuff. You can get them back if you go to your tombstone on the same level and pick that stuff up and then extract again. But just another thing to think of, if, if you use this specific rig that is fully customizable, whether you lose that specifically, or if you just lose the upgrades that you implement onto it. Actually, I think that would be a good balancing system where, sure, you can make an OP rig, but those pieces are expensive and you lose them if you die. I don't mind that as a system now where you use that as rig customization and then you know if you put the pieces onto it and die you lose the pieces i think that would be a really good way of balancing this system where you obviously create something really really powerful but you have a chance of losing a lot of resources this is kind of the same way with weapons right now so you know something to keep in mind moving on somebody asked whether any new weapons will be added i.e future tech and future enemies actually surprisingly yes they are planning on adding new futuristic weapons and kind of cool futuristic enemies if they can really they're focusing more on the weapons and gear portion of it they do definitely want to add future tech that the players can use. That's not to say that only the players will be able to use it. If it's equipment like guns, then every faction will also have access to it. Jeff does mention that that's actually one of the only major hangups when it comes to adding stuff like that, where if it's something that's usable by the players, it also has to be usable by all the AI, so that means they have to adjust, you know, the hand placements on the different guns and all that stuff for basically every character model that they have to. So that's, you know, the only real thing that's going to keep a bunch of different stuff in, but it will come. Future tech is coming. Jason also mentions that he's trying to make it so that all the weapons have different sonic registries, which is super cool. And obviously when you interact with different future stuff, you can kind of make it a little more fun. So he's looking forward to that, which is kind of cool. I'm actually super into that. After that, somebody mentions that right now, most of the character models sort of rotate different randomizations when you die. With that in mind, the question that they had was whether there were plans to expand upon that in the future. And yeah, they are planning on expanding that. Right now, all the playable characters, except for Sean, and have a bunch of different models that will rotate. Jeff does mention that they do want to sort of expand on the different models that are there already, and any future playable characters will have this feature as well. He also mentions that they're working on sort of like an intro animation that happens when the new character shows up. So that's actually kind of cool. So there's a little bit of a, here's the new guy kind of thing. I do kind of like that. It really does kind of give a feel of you're not important at all. This is a brand new person. It gives the sort of Helldivers effect where every Helldiver that spawns in is a brand new guy instead of it just being the same guy over and over again. I do kind of like this. It's also very interesting and it sort of builds more into what's happening in the lore. Although it is kind of funny to think that there's just a bunch of different rotating copies of this one particular person. I.e. there's a bunch of different scab girls, there's a bunch of different old mans, you know. It's funny. I might be reading too much into this too, but it sounded kind of like Jeff Freudian slipped that there might be more playable characters to come after Gunhead. The way that he says something is really particular. I would watch the video specifically. Again, I might be looking too much into what he said, but something like that might be a little telling. It's kind of exciting. And after that, let's move on to some miscellaneous stuff. Somebody asked Jason specifically how heavy he likes his metal. Obviously, I think we all know that he's talking about the music genre. Upon hearing that question, Jason and Jeff went on basically a five-minute metal nerd conversation. I can't do that conversation any justice by just recapping the contents of it to you, so please go watch it. It's super cool to listen to them just talk about metal stuff. After that, somebody asked what the favorite runs were that the 
devs have either played themselves or seen. Jeff mentions a cool story that I think some of us have already had ourselves, where basically he was on the brink of death and then basically gave the call out, just go to the extract, leave without me, I'm not going to make it. And then for whatever reason, the AI just stops shooting you. And then obviously, miraculously, you hobble to extract and you make it and you just let a sigh of relief out. He's had that experience too, and I find that super cool. Jason also mentions one that he saw, I think it's probably an online video, where kind of Blair Witch style, some wild stuff happens on Elephant Graveyard. I think that this conversation is super interesting. Also, Jeff has a second run that he gave, which is basically his favorite, actually, but it was a moment that he saw in like basically a developer land party. Again, I would watch the dev QA. This is going to be a recurring theme in the next couple of questions. I can't do this story justice, or at least me recapping it would basically be him retelling it. Just listen to Jeff tell it. There's a more there's a lot more passion there. I'm just sort of reporting stuff. And then after that, a cool section, which hasn't happened before because Jason has never been here. We're going to go into some music questions. Somebody asked what Jason's favorite work on the soundtrack was. First of all, he wants to mention that he has seen and heard all the positive feedback and comments on his work and genuinely appreciates them. He goes on to mention that one of his early favorite tracks when they were trying to figure stuff out is the Blackout. And then he recognizes the track that they finally started to really hone in on what the sound for the game was going to be was on was on Lost Souls. It's honestly, again, super cool to listen to him talk about the music theory and the bunch of different sounds and stuff for the game. I would listen to Jason talk about this more than me. His descriptions are just very music. And now I've taken a couple of music theory and music history classes before, but I, I'm obviously not a composer or, an, or a music artist. I do play the guitar from time to time, but I, you know, a lot of what he talks about is sort of above me. I would honestly listen to him talk about it. His passion is very clear. I know a little bit about what it is he's talking about, but listening to stuff on music specifically from expert musicians is, it's so cool. I would listen to him talk about it. After that, somebody asked what the main inspirations were for the soundtrack. Kind of goes into how they wanted a very industrial and dark, grimy sound for everything. With that being said, because things were so dark in the soundtrack, they also wanted some uplifting noise and music. Having so much dark in the soundtrack, while the gameplay and just the general vibe of the Forever Winter is very dark and gruesome and heavy, it would be a little much and overbearing, so there's a lot of positivity and just very uplifting sound as well. They also kind of get into a very interesting discussion on creating sort of fakey languages for the different factions so that operatic vocalists can sort of make different sounding actual songs for the different factions from the different factions. I find that very interesting. Again, I would watch watch them talk about it. After that, moving on, somebody asked how they got the sound to be so grimy and yet so clean. This is a music engineering thing. Jason apparently used Serum. This is apparently, a, I think it's a plugin, which is basically a synth for the feedback that's given for all of the different stuff that you put into it. It's apparently very clean sounding. Again, I'm not an audio engineer. I would listen to Jason talk about this more specifically. Again, it's super clear that he's so passionate about this project and it means a lot to him. It sort of goes into what it is that I've been talking about in the last couple of months where it's very clear that everybody at fun dog studios is so very much into this project and it's so cool to listen to them talk about it anyway again watch this week's qa it's really interesting it's also different it's also 38 minutes long but you know they kind of ramble a little bit on the different music topics it's so cool and then finally, somebody asked what the different instrumentation and tone is used in the soundtrack. Apparently, gameplay feedback is what drives the actual instrumentation and mix in-game. This actually kind of makes sense, and it actually is kind of really cool. For example, if you take the in-game music and then compare them to the original soundtrack that's available, the OST will be brighter and punchier and sound more like an actual album, whereas obviously the in-game music is going to be a little softer and more rounded so that it allows for basically more of the actual in-game noise that's happening to sort of come through. It's it's really cool to hear that. There's definitely some differences between the actual OST and the in-game songs that are there, but, you know, not so much that it's not clearly recognizably the same song. But obviously when you're in-game, you need to be able to listen to the in-game noise, i.e. the mech footprints, the shots that are happening, all that kind of stuff. So this is actually really interesting. Honestly, this week's QA was one of the more interesting ones. There was a lot of very cool tailored questions specifically for Jason the answer with these music questions. I actually really like them. I don't apologize that I don't want to recap what it is that he said because listening to somebody so passionate and is clearly an expert on this field is so cool. I am not going to steal that from him. 
listen to Jason talk about the music in this game. It's so very interesting. But yeah, right now we're sitting waiting for the new update to come out. Hopefully that is available soon. They said by the end of October and we're kind of nearing the end of October. Who knows when that'll pop up though? You know, development time varies. These are also people. They're not robots, so they're not working all the time whether or not you want them to. Either way, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate you. If you want to support me and the channel, don't be afraid to like and subscribe. Comment down below what it is that your favorite original soundtrack song is, and I might give you mine. And finally, do me a favor, please don't die. I will see you in the next one.